Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, episode 56. New Antiviral Strategies with Carla Kierkegaard. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place uh, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. There was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there to be an extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans. That would equate to something like 20 to 30 years. How close are we to actually having a therapy? Ballpark, 10 years. It's potentially one of the things that might be rocking the world the same way that uh, people said, oh, the sun's the center of the universe, so oh, this and that and everything. And now here's somebody who can come out and say, hey, look, here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative. So well, let's get started. Um, uh, we're really lucky uh, today. We have two uh, fantastic virologists um, with us. I'll introduce our guest host today, uh, who is Vincent Racaniello. Um, he is professor of microbiology and host of two podcasts that are on the air right now. Um, uh, this Week in Virology and This Week in Parasitism. And there's a new one coming up soon. I'll let him mention it. And he's author of a textbook called uh, Principles in Virology. Um, and one thing really interesting about him, and we're going to have to pull him on for another, uh, another show, um, is that he was the first one to produce an infectious clone of a virus, of an animal virus, that is. So uh, welcome, Vincent. <laughs> Mark, <laughs> always great to be on Futures in Biotech. Thanks for having me. And oh, did I mention you're a professor at uh, Columbia? <laughs> I said professor of microbiology and uh, immuno, uh, microbiology, but I might not have said Columbia University. Well, so welcome, welcome. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on because we're going to be talking about viruses, and uh, you know, uh, you've you've thought all about them for a few more years than I have. <laughs> I, I'd like to also welcome uh, Dr. Carla Kierkegaard, and she is the uh, she's a professor and chair of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Stanford University. School of Medicine. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be here. Um, you, you and Vincent almost crossed paths academically, <laughs> didn't you? Uh, before we get <laughs> into right. viruses, let's put people into context here. Um, so Vincent did his postdoc in David Baltimore's lab. And did you postdoc in his lab or PhD? I postdoc in his lab. And when I went to interview... I still remember going in to talk to Vince. The um, music was on so loud that I said <laughs> hi and tried to introduce myself. And he said, what? <laughs> and I said, hi. And I tried to introduce myself again. And he said, what? And then I kind of realized he didn't want to talk. <laughs> but he's gotten a lot friendlier as he's, as he's grown up. Yeah, I don't <laughs> listen to music anymore. That's probably why. <laughs> So yeah, that's, it's amazing. So yeah. Um, and, and that was in Boston? Cam was yeah, yeah, in Cambridge at MIT. Oh, at MIT. Wow. Um, th those were some really exciting times uh, at, the, at the start. Uh, Vincent had, had, you know, was sequencing the first uh, animal viral genome. Um, one that is particularly small. And, and so it's, it was a polio virus, right, uh, Vincent? Right, it was polio virus, which we found out was 7,440 nucleotides long, which is relatively small as virus genomes go. Not the smallest, but for me at the time, this was 1979, it was really big because I needed to find the sequence of that genome. And nowadays, uh, George Cross could do it in a, George Church could do it in a blink of an eye, but it took me a year to do it. Wow. Um, I remember sequencing DNA in, in 1995, 96, and spending weeks for a couple hundred bases. Uh, and uh, you were doing it uh, 15 years in advance, uh, more. Um, so, so maybe, uh, Carla, you could tell us a little bit. So you, you work on uh, RNA viruses and uh, on, vi the, from what I gather, the, specifically the, the uh, you know, replication of the viruses or the RNA replication 
but before we go into any of the details about the biology of a polio virus, uh, could you tell us a little bit about what the scale of this virus is? Because when I, I'm a cell biologist, I always think in, you know, in the size of a cell. Uh, how how can we put this into context in terms of size and biology? Well, when I when I teach um, non majors about uh, viruses and microbes. I always try to imagine that they're a million times bigger than they are. And if you are a million times bigger than you are, then you can lie down and your feet are in LA and your head is in uh, Boulder, Colorado, which is why I, where I used to teach. And um, at that scale, the, a cell is about the size of a large lecture hall, which is usually where we are. And a vaccinia virus is about the size of a watermelon. And a uh, <laughs> A polio virus is about the size of a lemon. Wow. So that's, that's how we do it. That's <laughs> and great. a bacterium is about the size of a Volkswagen. So, wow. you know, these things, these things help me anyway. To, and a million fold is a good, good metric. So, so that's how and small they are. I'm picturing Colorado to, uh, um, to uh, California, <laughs> Stanford. And so at one lemon... Uh, and how long does it take to kill you? Is that a pretty toxic <laughs> limit? Well, yeah, it can take. Well, if you if you have Ebola virus, it can take you know about a day and a half, right? Or cholera, which is the size of a very long, skinny car, maybe a limo, <laughs> um, a day and a half. Wow. So um, yeah, that's pretty good. But th but they're not alone. You know, there are millions of them. So. Um, they take up uh, a lot of space. So, Carl, you said right, the, you le the lecture hall, the cell is the size of the lecture hall. Is that the analogy that you made? Yeah, a large one. So, in a cell, would that lecture hall be relatively empty or relatively full? It would be so full of stuff that you could hardly make your way through it, right? It would be full of like viscous, it would be full of like styrofoam balls of all different size um, connected by jello. How would you move around in that? <laughs> yeah, there would be, yeah, so I guess microtubules in the cytoskeleton, right? So you'd pull yeah. yourself, there would be like bungee cords connecting around <laughs> in the cell. Right. And you would pull yourself through that viscous mix along those cords. Right. But the viruses have the uh, incredible ability to cause that uh, lecture hall to just literally explode in, in, in a short period of time. How long does it take for a virus to cause lysis? Uh, um, well, some viruses can do it in four hours. Polio can do it in about seven or to ten, depending on the cell type. Right, Vince? Yeah, and you know, if we move into the... Uh arena of bacterial viruses, there are some that can do it in 20 minutes. In fact, my colleagues here who used to work on viruses of bacteria said they could do two experiments in a day if they planned it well because the virus grows so quickly. So maybe but you could tell us a little... The, go ahead. We, I'd like to I know a little say, bit about biology. I was going to say, but the reason I started working with RNA viruses had nothing to do with the fact that they were viruses. Actually, I mean, my training was really in, in DNA protein interactions. And one of the most exciting things that happened when I was a graduate student is, is the work of Tom Cech and uh, others who showed that RNA could be, you know, so usually information flow like in our bodies goes from DNA, which is our genes, to RNA, which are called the messengers, to protein, right? And then there was an amazing discovery in... Um, gosh, I'm not even going to say the date, but that, that RNA <laughs> could have function, right? That it was not just information, it could have a function. So suddenly there was this idea that an RNA molecule could be like the mother molecule, the, the original origin of life, something that had both information and function. And then by replicating itself, you wouldn't even need any proteins. Maybe that was how life was before there was all the the, the fancy storage machine, which was the DNA, and then the proteins, which were the workers, right? So that concept, which was just, you know, um, articulated mainly by Tom Cech, was so fascinating to me that I just wanted to work on RNA. And I wanted to work on RNA specifically, that that encoded something that was almost alive. And that turns out to be a virus. Um, 
you know, in the hopes that we would get some glimmer of, of, of prebiotic life and how it might work. Yeah, I've, that never, I've never heard that before. I've never heard <laughs> that uh, explanation, Carla, for why you started working on viruses. But, <laughs> you know, I noticed you said there was RNA once, there was an RNA world, and then the fancy DNA came along. <laughs> and I wonder... That, so that, that implies that DNA is better in some way, and that's maybe why we all have DNA today. Why is that? Do you, do you ever think about that? Yeah, well, DNA is better because it's chemically more stable and because it's, um, it can make these double helical structures that are unwindable at you know, reasonable temperatures um, you can have basically two copies, right? It can repair a lot easier. I guess I'm just making this up, of course. Um, but you know, DNA is more stable than RNA, and it's you know, therefore, if you're going to live a long time and have a lot of progeny and not make a lot of mistakes, maybe that was the the choice. Mm. Well, I mean, there are a lot of viruses with RNA, and they're pretty successful, but there are no cells with RNA, right? It's always DNA. That's right. And maybe That's right. Also... So I think it has something to do. With, yeah. Go ahead. No, I, so well, it might have something to do with longevity. Well, back in the time, I suppose, when life existed on Earth solely as RNA, right? That's what you're suggesting, which is pretty interesting. I mean, it's it's it's, it's the it's the age old question: How did life start on Earth? But uh, if if the RNA could act as an enzyme and replicate itself and propagate. Uh, and that's the essence of life. D does that, and well, is that alive? And then you said you wanted something that was close to alive. Is the virus alive? They, I mean, Vincent <laughs> and I always have this argument. Uh, and even with uh, Peter Pelize, he joined in and uh, uh, Vincent and Peter didn't agree. Uh, is, is, is that virus partially alive? Is RNA alive when it's in that primordial soup? Well, that, of course, becomes a semantic question, which has to do with your definition of life, which is more religious than scientific. So one will continue to disagree. You know, I mean, there, there's no way to resolve such an argument. Um, okay. Can it propagate? Can it change? Yeah. Um, right. It depends on your definition of life, of course. So RNA, so the RNA world theory goes, was originally condensed on sort of surfaces by surface catalysis and um, then was able to do simple reactions including template other nucleotides onto itself and cause them to condense so that was the first replic genome replication and so if you can do a little work and you can replicate yourself you're you're getting close to life right so you're saying the the nucleic acid required a catalytic surface could you explain? So goes the theory. Well, people who try to put together prebiotic soups of various kinds ask what kinds of conditions, metals, temperatures, etc., could cause nucleic acid condensation. And they usually come up with some sort of a surface, um, you know, rock or, or metal. Mm -hmm. It's really, um, it's a very interesting field and people try to try to mock it up all the time. But they usually get a few nucleotides, and that's about it. So, Carla, we still have remnants of that today, right? The way vir RNA viruses at least replicate their genomes, they still seem to like surfaces. Exactly. Exactly. They replicate on, um, well, all, all positive strand RNA viruses anyway, and the other RNA viruses are an interesting story as well. Um, all positive strand RNA viruses replicate on membranes in the so they um and especially our our beloved polio virus since um you know it it replicates it proliferates all these membranes in the cell and then just sits on the top of them it's not like it tucks inside or anything to protect itself it just uses all this surface and um sets up its proteins on that surface and um yeah these things really interest me so maybe that's a remnant of the primordial soups where nucleic acids were without viruses or cells and they were they were just replicating on surfaces well and it's a principle that is interestingly been, been rediscovered by you know synthetic organic chemists so 
surface catalysis is a big deal in, um, in chemistry. And if you ask people, why would you put all the catalysts on a surface? And the answer is, you know, if you're just going to go from A to B, then it only depends on the concentration of the catalyst. But if you're going to go from A to B to C to D, using the same catalyst over and over again, then it makes sense to have it on a surface and all localized because then you don't have to unbind and rebind and unbind and rebind to go from A to B to C to D. So, you know, there's nothing more iterative than copying an RNA genome. You know, you make a negative strand, then you make a positive strand, then you make a negative strand, then you make a positive <laughs> strand. So, um, you know, it's not a really uh, varied cycle. So that's why I, I think, you know, I think especially something like RNA replication would occur on a surface. So maybe it's instructive to tell the listeners that um, th there are certain kinds of RNA viruses that do that, but others do not. And perhaps understanding why they don't um, tells us how those reactions proceed. So the viruses with negative strands or with two strands of RNA joined together, double strand, they don't tend to need this surface, right? So they do something else instead. But before well, we even I, get to I'm that, so I'd say, what yeah. is the positive and negative strand RNA virus versus sure. what's a DNA yeah. virus? Well, let's define, um, yeah, because these are terms that were actually defined by... Uh, by the ancients, including, I shouldn't say ancients, <laughs> but our, uh, our predecessors in the field, including, uh, including our, our shared postdoctoral advisor, who's um, David Baltimore. But, okay, so positive strand viruses are those that they come in and they have all the information necessary to make their proteins. So they are also the message for the protein and the ribosome can just bind to them and make proteins. And that's why Vince could clone the first um, RNA virus because it just had to make all the DNA had to do was make the RNA and then it was like a message in the cell. It's taken the other RNA virus virologists a long time to, to, to duplicate his efforts. So that's just like um, messenger okay, RNA. So the virus strand. has a, it has like a, a piece of messenger RNA, which is the intermediate between DNA and protein synthesis. Right, but not in RNA viruses. They don't even go there. They don't even do anything with DNA. They just take the right. RNA. Their, their lifestyle is so simple. They just take the RNA. They translate it into protein. The protein makes the negative strand RNA. The protein makes a positive strand RNA. The positive strand RNA makes more protein. It's a very intimate relationship between the RNA and protein. Um, sure. It just avoids the mechanism. whole DNA level. But Vincent didn't. Yeah. He didn't. <laughs> he used the DNA. But that's how he cloned it. All right. So that, that makes sense for the... For the by the way... Um, one thing that I like to tell new guests is that there's about a half second lag. So while it sounds like there's interruptions and interjections, uh, it's rather difficult because while well, we're on each, we're, you know, s several thousand miles away uh, and we're traveling in multiple directions. So if it's, it's almost like we're on the moon. Um, just, that <laughs> cool. was just a little bit of an interjection here. There's quiet pauses here. I sure. used to edit those out. Now we can't because we're going live. But uh, So Mark, it's probably worth pointing out and that the reason I made a DNA copy of polio was because you can do things to DNA that you can't do to RNA and you still can't do to this day. You can make very specific changes, you can make lots of DNA, you can make new viruses essentially. So that's, that's the reason why we changed polio into a DNA virus of sorts, uh, to mm -hmm. be able to do things in the lab with it. Clone it, at the time yeah. especially. But I suppose you could you could just get a machine cranked up and make the RNA. Um, Transfect it. Can that that's be done? a good that question. Done? I'm not sure it's so easy to chemically synthesize RNA. Do you know? Do you know, Carla? I don't. I don't think anyone could really make a 7,500 nucleotide RNA in a okay. stable way. Okay. Um, no, you would still still these days you would go through a DNA because you know for the reasons we discussed, which is that RNA is just not as stable. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I used to dose uh, and we don't RNAs have... away <laughs> and spray everybody with it in the lab. <laughs> Nobody joined walking the lab without washing their hands with RNAs away. It's kind of an irritant <laughs> too. <laughs> used to inject it into frog eggs, but that, I digress. <laughs> so, th so the RNA of a, a polio virus, it's a positive strand RNA. And from what I understand, it 
uh, it already has the message. The cell sees that message, translates it to protein, and then that protein that the RNA uh, or that the virus RNA makes creates a negative strand to template, and it starts producing more positive strand RNA. And that's the cycle. That's it's it. very very simplified. Yeah. And what's a, in, in counterpoint, what's a negative strand RNA or RNA virus, and which are more common? So positive strand RNA viruses are the most plentiful viruses on the planet. There are more varieties of them than anything else. So I guess that makes them the most successful. Negative strand RNA viruses are often in the news, though. I mean, influenza is one. Uh, Ebola virus is one. So a negative strand RNA virus is one that comes in actually as an so a negative strand, that means it can't make any proteins. So it has to come in with all the wherewithal to copy itself before it can make any proteins. So the, the, the virion that contains a negative strand genome also has a polymerase. It has lots of RNA binding proteins that let the RNA get copied. So the first thing a negative strand virus has to do when it gets inside the cell is copy itself. So it's a little, it was a little more difficult to to make those infectious clones. Hey, Carla, can I ask you a, a thought question? Why aren't all RNA viruses positive strand RNA viruses? I'm sorry, say that again? Why aren't all RNA viruses positive strand RNA viruses? If they're so successful and it's a really simple strategy, why hasn't all viruses evolved to, to do that? Um, evolutionary, the other viruses are stuck in evolutionary cul-de-sacs. <laughs> 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 they Could went all that? direction and just got stuck there. <laughs> well, um, you know, could I explain what I mean by that? I mean, I mean, that, that was a, a slightly facetious answer, but I mean, not all life is perfect, right? I mean, I mean, it's, it's interesting, we talk about evolution as being, you know, an optimizing force, but at any given time, you can only make a few steps through sequence space, through evolutionary space to get somewhere else. You know, I mean, if a, a mouse suddenly, you know, thought, well, I'd be really good if I had a pouch like a kangaroo, you know, there's not going to be a mouse with a kangaroo, you know, with a pouch tomorrow, because that took sure. so many steps of evolution. Mm. Similarly, I mean, a negative strand virus can't just convert to a positive strand virus. It would require many, many steps. So even if, even if you would say, I'm, and I'm not saying positive strand viruses are necessarily better, but, but there are niches and evolutionary niches that get occupied and then you can't really deviate from that. Sure, I think that's so a beautiful a answer, yeah, because most, most people think of evolution as a trajectory towards the best, but it, evolution just makes whatever can survive at a given time and uh, so that these negative strand and double strand viruses can survive so they're there and that's all there is to it but they're not necessarily the most <laughs> abundant they're too they see, they're seemingly far more complex than polio right uh, polio has uh, what you guys said it was 7500 roughly 7400 7500 bases of nucleic acid um, it, that's you know a fraction of a well, I guess is it a fraction of a gene, a fraction of a human gene with introns, of course. Uh, it's so so small, but encodes everything it needs to take over an individual, and rapidly too. And, and is the success of a virus death of the or just reproduction, death of the uh, um, the infected person or not necessarily person, but species or organism? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you were Ebola virus and you infected someone, and that person dropped down dead in five days, what, what happened to you? I mean, you don't get to spread, right? right so right. so you, usually the, the dogma in the field of pathogenesis is that the, the, the eventual, the evolution of a virus with, re, with respect to its host will be to come to some sort of equanimity, you know, with that host. Um, that is the virus, it's not in the virus's best um, interest to kill the host or even make the host sick unless that host's disease helps its transmission. So, for example, cholera, which causes you, that's which is a bacterium that gives you diarrhea. I mean, not to be unpleasant at lunchtime, but sure. that does... <laughs> 
facilitate its transmission. And influenza, which causes you to sneeze and spit on other people, facilitates its transmission. So, so those pathogenic symptoms are in the interest of the microbe. But, but otherwise, I, I don't think there's any reason for a microbe to make you sick evolutionarily for the microbe. It's probably worth pointing out that the vast majority of virus infections, at least of eukaryotes like us, not bacteria, probably don't cause illness. They don't kill the host and they just effectively transmit the genome. Because in the end, that's how I view it. Nothing matters except the genetic information of the virus being propagated. And so that probably happens without cell death in most cases. We just don't see it. Well, you know, right. our body... Did you read... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. There was a recent paper by, um, from the laboratory of Skip Virgin at Washington University. Maybe you guys talked about it on this show that showed that herpes virus infection, which most of us have, I mean, most of us are latently infected with some kind of herpes virus or other, um, mm -hmm. protects against some kind of, kinds of bacterial infections. Right. So wow. there seems to be our relationship to herpes virus is, is a, you know, despite that it gives us occasional cold sores and stuff, is, is actually a pretty good one. <laughs> well, isn't half our genome uh, virus, viral origin? I mean, uh, Dr. Church yes. was saying that in one of the past episodes. So that's, uh, it, but it, that's when it, it fails, right? That's when, I guess, a virus dies is when it just becomes integrated into the genome and doesn't replicate. Well, it's still being transmitted, right? It goes from generation to generation. The, the, as I said before, if you just think about a genome, not a particle, not anything else, those retroviruses in us are still being transmitted. And who's to say that one day some of them won't be repaired and they will go to another host in some way. So I don't think you should view them as dead, even just because they can't make particles. They transmit pretty well. How, how, much, how many viruses... Right particles are we carrying on our cells right now? I know that for every human cell, what is it? There's 10 bacterial cells. So if there's, uh, or, or more, we're two, there's two point, sorry, what are the numbers? 10 trillion cells or 1 trillion cells in the human body. We're carrying 10 trillion bacteria, which make up about 2.5 kilos in, in mass. That's uh, roughly about <laughs> five pounds of bacteria, <laughs> which makes you wonder why is the human genome the human genome? It's the human genome plus the you know the microbial genome that we're carrying is is the same apply to viruses i'm wondering uh how many viral particles we're carrying on ourselves right now even in a healthy individual you mentioned herpes virus you know that's one. part of there's a lot of viral discovery going on i mean it's not i mean the history of studying viruses is very interesting right because we studied them from the point of view of the ones that make us sick right and and those are that still you know attracts a lot of our interests but most of them don't. And a lot of them, I think, we don't know about. For example, there have been some recent papers of, of new um, picornaviruses, actually, a Tyler's virus, which was thought to be just a mouse virus. It is, you know, a lot of people are carrying it around. I think there's a lot of virus discovery that still needs to be done. Um, so I think it's harder to answer that question for viruses and for bacteria. Well, I, I suppose that, you know, as we move towards like understanding um, the life sciences, you know, and we accumulate knowledge, we're eventually going to have a, a, a control of, you know, I suppose pushing what we're doing right now in 50 to 100 years, we might have a great deal of control over life. But one thing is we'll never have complete control over the viruses because it'll be, in, as long as we're alive, we'll have that fight. Won't we? Oh. <laughs> Maybe that's a, for another show. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the work that's going, going on in the lab? That, uh, let, if you could take us uh, you know, through the cyberspace into your lab uh, and, and uh, tell us a little bit about the projects that you're, you're actually doing on polio and how they, why you selected polio and uh, how it applies to general virology and, and pushing our knowledge of our understanding of viruses forward. What are the main projects that, that well, are going on at Stanford? Yeah. Um, well, I guess there are a couple main projects, but one of the ones that I've been really interested in lately is uh, drug resistance in viruses, which is relevant to all of us. I mean, if you have, if you're infected with a virus, you notice that people don't give you medicine. 
<laughs> for it for the most mm -hmm. part because there, are, there, there aren't good medicines, especially for RNA viruses. And there's one simple reason for that. I mean, there are people working very hard on it. There are excellent drug targets. Um, the one reason for it is the genetics of the viruses, which is they make so many mistakes um, as they copy themselves that pretty soon, if it takes one or two mutations to make a drug-resistant virus, you know, it pre-exists before you even take the medicine. So, as you know, in the case of um, HIV that causes AIDS, people now take, you know, three or sometimes even four drugs so that they don't become, um, so that they don't select for drug-resistant viruses. But in the work? case of, of, how does that work? Yeah, how does well, taking three okay, so it's a, how does, yeah, how, how does, does taking three or four drugs um, prevent uh, the, the resistance or the propagation of the virus? So it's a simple um, mathematical argument, okay? If you have HIV, for example, it's 10,000 nucleotides long. And, if, and it has an error rate of about 3 times 10 to the minus 4, or let's just say 1 times 10 to the minus 4. So on average, every new RNA genome of HIV has one mutation in it. So if it takes um, one mutation, which is often the case, to give you resistance to a drug, and you have um, 10 to the fourth viruses in you, then that drug-resistant virus already pre-exists. But mm -hmm. the problem is, is you have about 10 to the tenth viruses in you if you're infected with HIV. So you have, what, 10 to the sixth drug-resistant viruses <laughs> already <laughs> to the drug before you took it. So that's why you don't want to take what's called monotherapy because, um, you know, that's, you just select the drug-resistant viruses will grow. Mm -hmm. So what if you take two drugs? Then the probability is 1 in 10 to the 8th, right? So you have 10 to the 10th viruses, you have 100 of them that are resistant to both. Oh, wow. So if you take three drugs, the probability is 10 to the 12th, 10 to the minus 12, that, that it's a... Yeah, so, so, you know, it's a good chance that if you take three drugs that drug-resistant virus won't pre-exist. And if, if then all the replication of all of them is suppressed, then you won't, um, you know, then that new virus won't arise. So that's why, you know, the last thing you want to do is take one drug <laughs> for an RNA virus. So, for example, mm -hmm. for hepatitis C, which, you know, what, 200 million people in the world have it, there's no approved, even though the drug companies are working very hard on antivirals, and there are a bunch of them, all of which are associated with drug resistance, the FDA and similar agencies in other countries won't approve a, a so-called monotherapy because that would just select for a drug-resistant virus right away, and then that drug would be useless in the ultimate cocktail that they want to prepare. So, Carla, why sense? do we have just... Uh Basically, one or two drugs for flu. Those are licensed. We have Tamiflu, also Tamivir, Relenza, two, two similar targets, and then the amantadines. So why were those just licensed before we understood this, or what's the story there? Well, there is resistance associated with them, right? Absolutely. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think... It's those kinds of, and I, I, well, I've been wondering about that. Like why during this last swine flu episode weren't people given, I mean, you had to be very, very sick to be prescribed any drug. And I think it was to prevent the spread of drug resistance. Um, I think they're very carefully um, administered, actually, or they should be. <laughs> Is it well, possible that positive had, strains or and, and, and DNA viruses and negative strain or, or, uh, viruses? Could you, you don't necessarily need to with a, a negative strain because of the, the difficulty it, it has to mutate away from its end state, evolutionary end state, as you called it. <laughs> uh, no, I think the error rates are a little lower for negative strand viruses. And, but I, I, I think that there is the problem of drug resistance with influenza, but, but Vince makes a good point. I'm not quite sure why it's really a less spectacular, um, the, the arising of drug resistance is less spectacular in, in, in negative strand RNA viruses. I mean, it's so bad with hepatitis C that, that I mean, people are in, you know, there are clinical trials now for, um, 
all kinds of, of, of drugs, and all of them are associated with uh, drug resistance. In fact, it's just considered the hallmark of, of a good antiviral that you'll develop drug resistance against it. Wow. <laughs> but, but Carly, you heard have that a, said. It it so, Carly, you have this, this approach to antivirals that gets around that problem, and that I think we need to hear because it's, it's really brilliant. So maybe you can explain it to everyone. Okay. So, well, thank you. <laughs> so it has to do with um, with the way viruses uh, with their, their 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 lifestyle. Okay. So so if you're a, if you're a virus and you're born, you're a newly born virus. You're born in a cell, and your your mom is in that cell with you. And there are a lot of cousins and brothers and sisters all around you, and they are, they're all slightly mutant with respect to you, everybody, but you're all stuck in the same cell, right? So that means there's a lot of possibility to interact with each other. So the math of drug resistance that I just gave you um, assumes that when a drug-resistant virus is born, it's directly selected for, right? There's nothing in the way of it and expressing its drug resistance. But there can be things in the way of, of a virus expressing its drug resistance. Namely, if it's stuck in a cell with a bunch of other viruses that are interfering with the expression of its drug resistance. So if I can give you an example. So, so you're in that lecture hall, okay, with, with 200 other people. And you're all, um, and you, Mark, mm -hmm. are the, the most fit person in that room. And, um, and the selection comes and will you or will you not be able to express your fitness? So if the selection is, you know, let's say a flash flood and you're the only one who can run fast, you know, you'll run out of the room, right? And mm -hmm. the fact that other people can't even get out of their chairs won't interfere with your being able to run out of the room. But mm -hmm. if you're trying to do some, a complicated task that involves a lot of pieces, like doing a jigsaw puzzle, and you are the world's champion jigsaw puzzler, but other people in the room are screwing up, and they're not only not able to put together their jigsaw puzzles, they're throwing their useless pieces over on your table, right? You will be what we call dominantly interfere. Your ability to do your jigsaw puzzle will be dominantly inhibited <laughs> by right. the other people in the room, right? Mm -hmm. so, so by that analogy, if I'm a new virus and I'm born into a cell and I'm surrounded by these unfit cousins and brothers and sisters and relatives... And I'm trying to put together, for example, a capsid, which has a lot of pieces to it, and the drug is against that capsid. Their horrible little pieces will be floating near me, and I'll put together a chimeric capsid. And even though if I were left to my own devices, I could put together a drug-resistant capsid, I can't do it with them there, right? Right. So, so my thesis is that anything that is it drug targets for highly mutable viruses should be those that are highly oligomeric, that is, have lots of pieces to them, so that the drug-sensitive viruses in the same cell will interfere with the drug-resistant virus ever showing that it's drug-resistant, and it won't be selected out. That is a so very what, complicated thought. So what kinds of targets are, as you say, highly oligomeric? Is, is it two subunits or three, or are you talking about dozens? Well, you know, that becomes really an empirical thing, right? You know, it depends on how many subunits you need to poison. Um, so definitely capsids, you know, which for poliovirus, there are 60 copies each. For um, hepatitis C, it's an un unknown number that are in the core, but probably 180 or so. So um, I'm, I'm just going to take a quick step back. So we're talking capsid, which is the protein envelope that wraps around the nucleic acid. Which it's the protein the shell. So the envelope is, is the protein that sticks in the membrane of envelope viruses. Poliovirus okay. is, a, is what we call a naked virus that, is, that doesn't have a membrane. So ground protein. And even envelope viruses like hepatitis C virus or influenza mm -hmm. have, have a highly iterative little shell that surrounds the nucleic acid and protects it. So even envelope viruses have this highly um, oligomeric, you know, you can think of it like a Buckminster Fuller uh, dome, right? A, 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 a geodesic dome or something that surrounds them that, sure. like a geodesic dome, is built of little iterative pieces that are put together in a very simple way. 
Uh, your, your audio is breaking up a little bit. Um, let me see if I understand this. Uh, we're, we're actually having... Should I unplug control. again? No, no, it's, it's good quality sound. It's the bandwidth issue there. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> um, an envelope virus like hepatitis C has a cell, almost like a cell membrane. It's made up of... It is a cell membrane. It stole it. It is. They stole it from the endoplasmic reticulum or the cell, you know. It pops itself out of the cell, capturing some of the cell's membrane. But inside that is like a, a, a geodesic, um, uh, uh, like, or like a 12-sided dice or maybe 18-sided dice that one might use for uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And this is exactly. <laughs> yeah, and inside that, the nucleic acid. So it kind of looks like maybe the, the top of the command mod or the uh, lunar module. And that's wrapped around with the big envelope. But not all viruses have that lipid protein envelope. Hepatitis C does, but polio doesn't. That's right. All right. And you, you mentioned that uh, out of the, for polio, there was 60 subunits. A subunit uh, being a, um, a, a, a protein unit. Uh, let, let's see. Sometimes right. a subunit is a part of a protein unit, but you consider the capsid as one entire protein. And there are 60 are... copies each of four different proteins okay. in the poliovirus shell or capsule. So that's like yeah. four different bricks, four different colored Lego bricks forming, uh, using, taking those four, re replicating it 60 times and forming that little, uh, little shape that looks like a, a soccer ball, <laughs> perhaps. Exactly. Yeah, I haven't counted the squares on a soccer ball though, so I don't know if it's 60. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... Yeah, um, we, sometimes it's good to take a step back because when you use oleg the terms like oligomeric uh, subunits and... Of course. Uh, yeah, I get <laughs> distracted. Okay, but so go ahead. Um, what, what were okay, <laughs> so what we, what we call, we're trying to figure out, so I'm on a, I'm on a, a, a quest mm -hmm. and I'm on a quest to convince uh, drug companies and others that if they want to beat the problem of drug resistance, they should choose the drug targets better to begin with. And ironically, the drug targets they should choose are not the really simple things, not the, the enzymes, for example, that are like one little protein floating around in the cell, um, but the complicated things like those capsids that have 240 different pieces. Or we found in my lab that the polymerases, which are often... In, in other systems are just simple monomeric, you know, go it alone type enzymes. In, in poliovirus and related viruses, they, they form these large sheets on the surfaces of the membranes that really? on which the, the virus proliferates. So we found that those are a quote, dominant drug target, unquote. And so we're just trying to, because it's a difficult concept, we're just trying to come up with a lot of very simple examples so people can get it, you know, like the jigsaw puzzle and the capsids sure. and, yeah. You, did you say that the RNA polymerase uh, for polio forms a sheet? Is it a, a crystalline sheet of protein or is it just a, a, a raft? <laughs> we, um, we don't know how big this sheet is. We know when we work with the polymerase in isolation, it forms two-dimensional lattices. And that those lattices give you what we call cooperativity. That is, um, you get, when working together, they're faster and more efficient on some kinds of RNA than the monomers working separately, the, the sim simple proteins working separately. Yeah. It's like a multi core so, processor to make process RNA quicker. Right, exactly. For probably the reasons I told you about, about surface catalysis, if you're going to go from A to B to C to D, you know, maybe you should have all your catalysts in one place, right? So that's, that's what we think. In any case, we came to that biochemical finding actually from the genetics. Um, that is, we found that, some, that a lot of mutations in the polymerase were what we call dominant. That is, when you had a defective polymerase around, the other polymerases couldn't work. And the, wow. the, the easiest way to do that is if you're part of a, of a you know, of a, of a wall, you know, if you're, if you're part of a, something that has multiple subunits, then it's only as strong as the weakest link, right? Mm -hmm. So, as we say, yeah, so that's what we discovered first was the genetics, that there were a lot of dominant polymerase mutations. And then we thought, oh, it must be an oligomer. 
So that's when we started looking at the biochemistry to see, does it function in a big raft? Um, so now what we're trying to do is figure out what it takes to make a, an evil protein like that. Like how do you, as we say in the, so if you want to make, if you want to make what we call a dominant drug, if you want a dominant drug target, that is a virus that when defective will screw up all the other viruses in the same cell. You know, you have to think, what's the nastiest, what, what, how can I make a drug that'll make this protein not non-functional, but nasty, right? So, right. <laughs> so as we say in the lab, if you want to ruin a party, you can't stay home. <laughs> you have right. to go to the party and then you have to be as obnoxious as possible. So that's what we're trying to do to the viral proteins as we seek what we call dominant drug targets. That's amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, um, first of all, this is a, it could be a paradigm shift in the way people design antivirals. One thing I know from pharma is nobody, I mean, this is very, very, uh, I mean, that would be considered high risk, high reward. Um, and I certainly companies like Gilead would, you know, simply rather just produce another antiviral that targets, um, uh, you know, the enzymatic function of a, an RNA uh, polymerase. But if, if you're saying don't, you don't need to screw around with, <laughs> pardon my French here, you don't have to play around <laughs> with the, uh, the RNA polymerase activity, but perhaps modulate its ability to form these two-dimensional lattices or two, these large rafts. And then they can, you know, through being lousy at, uh, it block the party. I mean, turn off the party that, is, is that the way, is, is that, am I understanding correctly that that's the best way to do it? Just uh, modulate the, uh, maybe the structure or, or select for drugs that interfere with the ability to form these large rafts of RNA, of RNA polymerase rather than attack the enzymatic activity. Or do you do both? Well, Can if you, you, do both? If you inter so that's why we talk about the party like that is because, um, so people might think that I'm simplifying for this radio show, but this is actually the way we talk in the lab too. Um, sure. <laughs> if, you, if you screw up the function of the protein's ability to join the raft, then that's the equivalent of staying home and not going to the party. What you have to do is let it join the raft and then have it malfunction in some way. So what we're trying to figure out is how to have it join the raft and then, and then malfunction. And so we're trying, and so far it's really interesting because what we found is that if you, if you interfere with the active sites, so that's what most of the antivirals do, right? They interfere with the active site of the enzyme. Those polymerases are fine. They join the raft and they don't actually bother the ability of the other polymerases to do their thing. They just form a structural part of the raft. But, but the polymerases that that's really um, inhibit the function of the raft are the ones that join, allow the polymerase to initiate, and then interfere with elongation. At least that's what it looks like so far. So if you think about, okay, I'm going to change analogies now. So if you, if you want to stop traffic on a narrow mountain road, you don't want your car to break down in your driveway. <laughs> that's the equivalent of stop and initiation, sure. right? You want to pull out onto the highway and then have the car break down. And that'll mess everybody up, right? <laughs> that's when everybody's yelling at you. Yeah, so that's, that's the kind of polymerase you want to make. How do you screen that, for that? How do you screen well, for that? maybe this should be discussed off the show in the presence of some lawyers so that we can talk about <laughs> how this could be commercialized because if this is a paradigm shift, and, and in my opinion, large pharma are very, very um, um, skittish about new strategies. Um, so how would one screen? Uh, identify molecules that can go communicate this misinformation to the rest of the gang. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. Because most of the kinds of screening that people do is just, you, you need to develop a high throughput assay, you know, a fluorescent nucleotide that doesn't, that starts to fluoresce when incorporated or something. And then you look for, you know, a million compounds that don't do that. So usually the is, easiest thing to do is initiation. But, you know, if we really find, as we suspect, and we haven't published this or anything yet, but, I mean, if we find, as we suspect, that it's a second and third nucleotide that you should not be able to put in, you know, we could, that could be developed as a high-throughput screen, right? We just mm -hmm. need to learn. We need to do the genetics to find out what sure. is the, what is the um, biochemical explanation for genetic dominance, and that's what we're trying to do now. So, but Carla, I will look, say that... Sorry. Yeah, go on. If you look at all the 
existing antivirals, you know, the flu, the 20 or so HIV, there's some for herpes viruses. Do any of those fulfill your criteria of being, of having this multimeric target that conveys this dominant phenotype? Do any of them function that way? Well, the genetics haven't really been done. Maybe the closest might be a mantidine for flu because it targets something that a, a protein, you know, a little pore, right? That, that is oligomeric. I mean, that, that is there are multiple subunits. So, so that, that might be, we haven't done the genetics on it to ask if you mix drug resistant and drug sensitive viruses is drug sensitivity dominant, which is what you'd expect to see. That's a good experiment, Vince. <laughs> so how does this apply to uh, the capsid? And uh, uh, then I, maybe a follow-up question would be, what's more strategic, preventing the nucleic acids from being replicated or preventing the particle assembly? But so first, how does it apply to capsids versus the polymerase? And then uh, what's better? What's a better strategy for an antiviral? Killing the uh, particle formation? Because what happens if a virus actually succeeds in forming? And then you've got to start all over. <laughs> well, I think that capsids are, are easier. Capsids are easier because, you know, capsids, you know, they, to form these little geodesic dome-like structures, right? There are many, many points of contact on the surface. So if you mess up one point of contact, it'll still glue itself on to the other surface that mm -hmm. it'll contact. So in experimentally, almost no matter what we do to a capsid protein, it, it still comes to the party. <laughs> right. right. It's, it's really hard to get capsids to stay home from the party. So, so that means that almost anything you did, and in our, in our hands, almost anything you do to a capsid protein makes it a dominant inhibitor of other viruses in the same cell. So I think theory aside, as far as which would be better, what step of the replication to block, I think capsid and core inhibitors are really a great idea. And uh, so the only reason they're not pursued. Molecules? Small molecules that block the interaction of the capsid protein subunits. So you've got your tetramer, uh, heterotetramer, uh, assembling with other heterotetramers, like you know, those four different Lego blocks trying to build with the 60 combinations. And preventing the protein interaction, is that the way to go? Well, you know, well, so what drug companies say when I talk to them is they say, well, you know, we don't like to try to block protein-protein interactions because it's, it's really hard to have a small molecule block a whole protein surface that has, you know, you know, 500 square angstroms of surface or something. But the point is you don't have to block it. You have to derange it. And I think <laughs> that's what's been, right? So deranging is just as good as blocking. And these are very complex structures that need to um, go through a lot of different conformational changes. So, so for example, anyone who thinks I mean, that that would be the easiest thing to do, because these are, you know, my kid has a, a 3D puzzle and finding the right piece, unless you get the right piece, yeah, it's not going to hurt it, but you jam in the wrong piece if the puzzle's finished. Uh, and the, 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 the level of, of three-dimensional electrical, uh, electrostatic properties, I mean, you can, you could find a molecule that fits a probably commercially available molecule that fits right in and destroys that. To me, I don't know. I just would tend to disagree with the pharma. Maybe the pharma are just too conservative. Well, I think that they don't... I think that the genetics of drug resistance is not very well understood and not really appreciated. I mean, you know, it's funny. Different fields, and I'm sure this is true for the fields of all of our listeners too, is there are, diff there are conceptions that come in, they're, they're like founder effects. So if a field is founded by people who think a certain way, that's sort of historically propagated. So the field of virology and antivirals was pretty much founded by, you know, physicists and biochemists. And, you know, so there's, there's a tendency to be very reductionist in our thinking. And I think that's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm the same way actually. But I just found that I was wrong so much that I started doing a lot of genetics too to ask what about function, you know, because sometimes you get an answer you don't, you don't expect at all. Well, I, I definitely think that this um, genetic proof of concept, right, to demonstrate that 
you know, um, going after the complex structures in the virus might be the best way to go. It seems really, really exciting. And I think it's um, uh, a great honor for us to, to be able to talk to you about this, you know, frontier of virology. Right? Um, I, I sometimes uh, forget that we have this great opportunity here on TWIT to, uh, to bring in scientists that are really pushing things forward. And uh, this seems like, you know, still early stage, but it could really change um, and save uh, how, many, how many people die from a viral infection per year on, on Earth. Right, and if you're changing the way uh, people are treated, you could literally your your discoveries could save, I don't know, fifty to one hundred million lives a year. It's a, it's a, it's an amazing thing to be able to come in this close to the frontier, and, and I really really appreciate it. Well, um, my goal is, as you can tell, these concepts are are difficult to understand, and so what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do, is to come up with a lot of simple examples. And we're testing, as Vince pointed out, you know, there are a lot of antivirals out there. So because the concepts are kind of hard to describe, what we're doing in my lab now is we're testing, selecting for drug-resistant variants of all the, you know, frontline hepatitis C virus drugs and testing to see whether they have any dominant, whether the drug-sensitive viruses can interfere with the drug-resistant ones. And we don't think they will. And then trying to show that simple compounds that little companies are making you know, that affect the cores and the other proteins that make, you know, highly iterative structures will have that property. And so then we're hoping to be able to communicate this concept a little better and more practically. Well, it's, it's pretty amazing. I, uh, I, I just really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you. Um, and uh, I, I, Thank I know, you. Vincent, do you, have, uh, do you have another question? Or? Think, well, Mark, uh, it depends how much time you have because I could ask <laughs> many, many more questions. Maybe I can I ask one more. I don't know. How, do you have enough time for one question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so there is um, there's an interesting approach to antivirals. In one hand, you, as you've discussed, you make antivirals that inhibit viral functions. But there is another approach, which is to make drugs that inhibit cell functions that the virus needs in order to reproduce. So maybe you could just give us your thoughts on how that would fare in, in terms of resistance. Is that more or less likely to give rise to resistance if you target a cell? I think the use of cellular... The the identification of cellular targets is very, very promising and should in principle, you know, so the idea for our listeners is if you target something in the cell that the virus absolutely needs, then how is it going to, the cell doesn't mutate at anywhere near the rate of the virus. And so what's the virus going to do? It's either going to die, which is what we want, or it's going to evolve not to need that cellular component. And if that route is not available to it, then it will die. In some cases, when people have targeted cellular components, you do get um, resist. You do get viruses that evolve not to need that cellular component. For example, there is an inhibitor of hepatitis C virus that targets a proline isomerase that helps the one of the viral proteins fold. And what you end up selecting for is folding variants that just don't need that that en that cellular enzyme to fold. But, um, but a great thing would be a cellular protein that you'd have to develop that's, for example, required a, a cap, you know, that worked on the capsids, like a heat shock protein, right? And that, mm -hmm. that, there's some of that in the literature. And then not only would you be targeting the cellular protein, but then the virus to evolve not to need it, it would have to do so in all its oligomers at the same time. So you could have this combined dominant drug target effect and the cellular protein. That's... I think that would be the way to take just one drug for a for an RNA virus infection. Well, this is going to be a little bit insider baseball, but uh, there will be a few people <laughs> listening that will be interested. Uh, how about a drug like deoxynogermycin? Is that how you pronounce it? That blocks glucosidase 2, that is an enzyme that's required for uh, ER assembly of the HCV viral um, envelope glycoproteins. And perhaps if you block access to the chaperones in the ER, like calnexin and calreticulin, you could uh, screw up the envelope. 
Is that, would that, is that, a, have, 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 what do you, do you believe that that, that would, the process works? I mean, it's been published by uh, a couple of uh, gly, glycobiology groups. Sure. I mean, it all works. These things often work in a couple cycles in tissue culture. And I, I don't know that work very well specifically, but, okay. you know, it's, it's an empirical, it's an experimental question. You know, anytime, you know, viruses can explore a lot of sequence space. They can't explore endless sequence space, as we were talking about earlier. You know, they can't decide to completely change their, their life cycle. But they can explore, explore a lot of sequence space. So whether or not they can develop resistance to it or not is not a theoretical, it's, a, it's an experimental question. So I, I guess the big question for you uh, is to understand how to eliminate the drug resistance more that so than just being able to knock out the function of one protein at a time and hoping that, that that drug sells for so many years until it becomes useless, right? It's really to tackle the process and the understanding of drug resistance. And to I, understand I, I, the I, genetics of drug resistance yes. in a way that doesn't involve, you know, let's take three or four crummy drugs and put them together. Now, you know, I have a lot of friends in, in, in pharma, but, you know, frankly, I mean, it's good for pharma if they can take three or four drugs and put them together, right? I mean, sure. there are a lot well, of very affluent people us. infected with HCV. Well, yeah. exactly. But, you know, HIV is a big problem. Positive strand viruses are a bigger problem because they're even, there's even more amplification associated with them. They never have this, stay, this DNA copy. So I think, you know, we'll probably need four in a cocktail. Wow. Well, I, 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 I really appreciate you coming on. This has been an absolute honor to, uh, to join your lab here at, uh, <laughs> at Stanford from, uh, from Cleveland. Um, uh, and also, uh, so I, 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 said, I guess it's a good time to say goodbye, but uh, I really appreciate you coming on. I mean, this is really, um, so it's, it's really at the forefront and getting into your lab is just uh, an opportunity for all of us and it's greatly appreciated. Thanks, it's fun talking to you. And also, uh, so that was um, Dr. Carla Kierkegaard. She's professor and chair of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Stanford University School of Medicine. And uh, we also have uh, Vincent Ragnello, uh, who is the host of This Week in Virology and This Week in Parasitism and professor uh, of microbiology at Columbia University. Thank you, Vincent, for coming on. Really appreciate oh. it. Always a pleasure. Whenever you, you have a virus urge, Mark, just give me a call and <laughs> I'll, I'll get my buddies on like we did today. Well, viruses are, are, um, are pretty scary. You know, um, when H1N1 uh, started coming out, uh, it, it pro posed an imminent threat on, or, uh, on the population, right? And, um, you know, it, it, it makes for a really great discussion because they're small and simple, at least fairly simple to, uh, to visualize and uh, give us really great uh, in-depth understanding of, uh, of biology right? As in its simplest form. So thank you. Uh, and, uh, we should uh, get, possibly get David Baltimore on to, you know, your old, uh, the mentor that, uh, that helped um, put your, you two guys uh, on the map. You know, that would be great. Give you the trip. Yeah. That would be fantastic. Um, I'd also like to thank Colleen Kelly for producing the show today. She uh, managed the boards and did a great job of uh, video switching and everything. Um, thank you, Colleen. I'd also like to thank the team that, that make this possible. Leo Laporte, Dane Golden, uh, Eric Lanigan, Tony Wang, and the rest of the team in Petaluma, California. Uh, if you'd like transcripts to the show, you can get them at futuresinbiotech.com. They're made, made, made available by the kind folks at Pods in Print. If you need transcripts done, they can handle even the most technical. Um, and there's there a few behind, but um, I'm bugging Tom, so he'll uh, he'll have them up soon. Uh, lastly, I'd like to thank Phil Peltier and Will Hall uh, for the opening and closing themes for Futures in Biotech. I'm Mark Peltier.